So here is a more challenging area problem. Uh, we want to find the area enclosed by these two graphs, right? One is a line, one is a cubic polynomial. You can see that, well, there, there's two things that make this more difficult than the last one. One is that we, uh, you weren't given, you know, a range, right? There's no saying, you know, do this between, you know, 0 and 4 pi like the last one. We just said find the area enclosed. So the first thing you got to figure out is, well, what exactly is the area that's enclosed, right? If you have the picture, then you can kind of see it, right? You can see that there's a bit here, and there's this bit here, okay? Now, how do you actually come up with that? How do you compute things? Well, one of, the, one of the things that you do have to kind of watch out for here, too, is the fact that there is, it's not simply a case of identifying top curve and bottom curve because the curves cross, right? So the first things that you look for in any kind of area between curves problem, if you're not given a region, right, is you got to figure out where are those points where the curves actually cross. Because that's going to define your region of integration, and it's also going to let you know if there are any added complications, like there is in this one, where we have to change our mind halfway through the problem about which one is the upper curve and which one is the lower curve, okay? Now, you're not always going to have the graph sitting in front of you, and in fact, this particular cubic is, is not so easy to graph by hand because the, the intercepts are actually not nice, okay? They're, the zeros for this particular cubic are irrational, and, and I don't think the, I think the max and min values are also, I mean, you can use quadratic to find the max and the min values, but they're not so easy to find either. The reason this one is chosen is, well, we want to make sure that the points of intersection come out nice, right? We want those numbers to be nice, and sometimes, you know, you can't have everything nice. So we go with the points of intersection because that's the thing that we want to find. So how would you find those points of intersection if you didn't know them ahead of time, if you didn't have the graph? Well, those points of intersection are points where both curves have the same x and y value, right? So for a particular x value, they also have the same y value, which is really saying that we're at an x value where f of x happens to equal g of x, right? Because these give the y values. So the first thing that we really should be looking for here are these points of intersection. Right. So for the points of intersection, we want to set f of x equal to g of x. So what that looks like for us is we're setting minus 2x plus 5 equal to x cubed minus 7x, oh, sorry, 7x squared. It should be 7x squared, otherwise you could just combine them, right? Um, minus 7x squared plus 12x minus 3. So get everything onto one side. So we're going to move, oops, move this stuff over. So x cubed minus 7x squared. Add the 2, now we have 14x. Subtract 5 minus 8 equals 0. You get a factor of cubic, right? Which is sometimes easier said than done. One of the ways you can do it, you can do a certain amount of guessing and checking. I mean, you can kind of, if you have the graph, it looks to me like 1, 2, and 4 are all going to work, right? Um, if you trust that your instructor has given you a reasonable problem where the, where the, points are going to be nice points, they're going to be nice numbers, they're not going to be some ugly, irrational numbers that you need a computer to find. Well, we know that if there's, a, if there's an integer solution to this polynomial, that integer has to be a factor of the constant term, right? This is the rational roots theorem. And so 8, the only possible factors for 8, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8. So if you don't feel like messing around with polynomial long division or any of that, you can just kind of do some guessing and checking, right? And so we can check that 1 works because if I do 1 cubed minus 7 times 1 squared plus 14 times 1 minus 8, that gives me 0, right? 15 minus 15. 2 works because 2 cubed 
minus 7 times 2 squared plus 14 times 2 minus 8. Well, okay, you can kind of see it here, right? 8 minus 8, 14 times 2 minus 7 times 4, 28 minus 28, yep, 0. 4 works because 4 cubed minus 7 times 4 squared. Now here we got to work a little bit harder, right? 14 times 4 minus 8. Okay, so that's uh, 64. No, 7 times 16, we got to think a little bit there. Um, 7 times 16, so that's 4 times 16 is 64. 3 more is 48. So I'm going to do this. It's 64 plus 48. Uh, 14 times 4 is 56 minus 8. And let's check out that that works. Yeah, because the 64 is canceled. Minus 48 minus 8 is minus 56 plus, yeah. Okay. So they all work out. Okay, so we're happy with that. We found our zero. So actually now we know that, that um, if we were doing, I guess we're doing, if we move that stuff over, then what we really have here is g of x minus f of x, right? So g of x minus f of x. Now that we found that our, our roots are 1, 2, 4, those work. So you can actually factor this, right? So this is going to factor as x minus 2, or x minus 1, x minus 2, x minus 4, okay? And then you got your old friend, the sine diagram. It's going to tell you that if you were to, let's put it down here, if you mark off 1, 2, and 4, it's going to look like plus, minus, plus, minus, right? So that's telling you that right between 1 and 2, positive, meaning g of x is on top, right? Between 2 and 4, it's negative, so that means that f of x is on top, right? We can also see it from the graph. But if you didn't have the graph, you can still work it out from the sine diagram, right? You can do this algebraically if you have to, but it's so much nicer to just have the picture to look at, okay? We don't worry about what's going on outside here because though there's no further points of intersection, right? We only care about what's happening between the points of intersection. So what this tells me is that the area comes in two pieces. I've got to do the integral from 1 to 2. And there, g of x minus f of x is positive, right? So I've got to do g of x minus f of x. Okay. And then from 2 to 4, I've got to do f of x minus g of x. All right, so we do it like that. Okay. So the rest is just plugging things in. And in fact, we already did g of x minus f of x. Um, we don't want the factored form, right? That's not going to be easy to integrate. We want polynomials. Polynomials are easier to deal with. So it's going to be the integral from 1 to 2 of x cubed minus 7x squared plus 14x minus 8. Right? You already did the work of, of simplifying g minus f, so no point in doing it over again. Right? We did it up there. Um, and then the other one, 2 to 4. Now we're doing f minus g, so we just have to switch the signs on everything. Minus x cubed plus 7x squared minus 14x plus 8 right? dx. Right? So we switch the signs because the curves cross. We want to ensure that we're... we're adding the areas, right? We want positive area overall. If you didn't account for this point of intersection in between, well, then one of these two areas is going to come out negative, right? Because we don't simply have a straightforward upper minus lower. The question of which one is upper and which one is lower changes halfway through, so you got to pay attention. Um, we've got the integral set up, which is really 90% of the job. The rest is simply evaluating the integral and its basic polynomial power rule integration. I think we'll leave it here. If you want to see the final answer, you can check the textbook.